Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I wanted to discuss my earliest book, The Transcendental Mimology, which, if you follow my work, you might have noticed that this one is quite different from all the other books. For one, it's quite cheap. It's only $3.75 a paperback, just a dollar in Kindle, and that's because it's so short. It's only, like, 35 pages, whereas my most recent book was nearly 700. And the truth about this book is that it's not really a book. It's more of an essay, and the truth about that is it's not even really an essay. It originally was the talk which I'm going to share in this video, um, recorded all the way back in November 2018. The truth is that I had not written anything for four years after dropping out of grad school, and I really wanted to, but I never really had the proper motivation, the proper occasion to get me back into it. And that moment actually arrived in November of 2018 when I was invited to speak at a academic conference called Imagining Imagination at a rural college nearby in Kanyuram Kulam, India. Now, I had never actually attended an academic conference in the United States. Even when I was in graduate school, I was supposed to be doing like th things like that, but I, I didn't. So this was my um, first conference, and certainly the first time I actually presented at one. I was fortunate that they gave me pretty much total freedom over what I wanted to talk about as long as it had something to do broadly with like visual media, etc. Um, so I chose memes and not just the memes that you see on your social media newsfeed, but the deeper memes, which are already in your head, which allow those to make sense. And I sort of um, did my first um, book about this talk rather than the other way around. It was not that I did the talk about the book. It was rather that I already had the slideshow first um, and the speech that goes along with it, um, which you'll see in this video. And then I wrote the essay based on that. And I decided to release this essay um, in order to test out the publishing um, on Amazon. And, you know, there were some things which I, I, I took a little bit of time to figure out, like you're not supposed to double space when you <laughs> release a book, um, even though obviously when you're writing in graduate school, you know, you have these ideas of how things are supposed to be done. If you look at this book, you'll notice it's an MLA format, just like the writing you do in graduate school is supposed to be, even up to the doctoral dissertation. Um, so this is certainly the work of somebody who was falling back on the memory of grad school from four years earlier to kind of determine how the right way to do things is supposed to be. Um, and I have definitely grown as a writer. This is not by far my, my best work, that first book, but it is a kind of nostalgic um, now in the year 2021 to go back to the recording from that time um, and share this talk with you. Now, I had some fun with the presentation itself in that it was a talk about memes, and I decided to use memes in the shallow sense um, and by actually going to, you know, that website where you can make your own memes, you superimpose text over well-known images. And uh, I had a lot of fun um, actually memeing the uh, presentation about memes into existence this way. So, uh, yeah, once again, if you want to check out that earliest text, the link uh, is available um, to Amazon in the video description. And you know, thank you for watching and supporting the channel. So this is a critique of transcendental memeology, the science of why memes really spread. Now, I chose to coin a new term, memeology, rather than subordinate memes to another established science like sociology. You could do the sociological account of which meme was most shared this year on this social media platform and comparing the trends on Twitter, with the trends on Facebook, with the trends for this political party or this country or whatever. And there's no shortage of that sort of analysis of memes. But I want to do, rather than an empiricist account of how this or that meme spreads, rather transcendental conditions for meme spreading, for transcendental conditions for memeing in the first place. And for that, I chose to take a philosophical path of expanding the definition of meme beyond this narrow definition of a viral image with superimposed text that gets shared on a social media feed, which is kind of what most people would say if you ask them what's a meme. Uh, kind of like the one that I have on this, um, this slide and really throughout the entire presentation I decided to do 
a presentation on memes with the material cause of memes being what it's made of, as you'll see. Um, but most people would say that's what memes are, but I want to maybe to expand that far beyond that narrow definition to show that all of our thought process is in a sense memological. There is a memological logic behind the way that we think and process information. And in fact, the very basis of truth is memological as I show, I hope, in the course of this presentation. So that of course begs the question, what are memes anyway? Most people would say they're just viral social media phenomena. In fact, the various most popular blank templates that get morphed into memes to suit a variety of outright contradictory ends on social media. I presented on this slide, you see all of these memes you're familiar with, but is memes, um, is memeing, I should say, something that goes beyond that narrow definition to maybe just include, as Richard Dawkins believed, the spread of ideas from one mind to another. And the original intention for Richard Dawkins coining the term meme in the 1970s with his book Selfish Gene was that he observed a phenomenon that didn't have a name which in the case of biology was the account for how ideas spread within a society in a way that's actually pretty analogous to the way that genes spread through a population. In both cases, natural selection is going to account for the success, both of a gene, I guess, within a, a population of organisms, but also for an idea within a population of minds. And because Richard Dawkins did not have a word readily available for which language would speak, as the later Heidegger would say, to talk about that, he had to consult the resources of ancient Greek to transliterate the term meme from the ancient Greek word mimestai, which really just means imitation. And that leads to the question, if we take a literal interpretation of this real word mimestai from which Richard Dawkins borrowed into um, the English language, we're really just dealing with imitations. But the question is, I mean, are, is meaning really just imitation? That might lead you, therefore, to consider a couple other positions for memeology to be supported to some other established school of thought. For example, you might take the aesthetic route and say that memes are just works of art. Uh, memes are works of art for which when the image of Willy Wonka shows up in your news feed, it's simply a work of art to be evaluated on aesthetic Grounds the same way you would with Mozart, the same way you would with Rembrandt painting, the same way you would with Leo Tolstoy and War and Peace. And that certainly is something which might seem promising, which will challenge in this presentation. But it goes to are memes just linguistic units of meaning? You might be tempted to think that a meme is simply a unit of information which gets which gets generated, shared, and evaluated with the exact same faculties for um, the generation sharing and evaluation of meaning that is linguistic in nature because you're using the faculties of generating information that really belong to language. Is linguistic creativity sufficient to account for memological creativity in the generation of various different means? Or rather, as I will argue, argue in this presentation, is memeology a unique science which deals not so much with imitation, plain and simple, not so much with art, not so much with linguistic units of meaning, rather with an underlying worldview which provides a structure which inevitably leads to a, sur a sort of geometrical distortion of any content that you evaluate in any of these other sciences. And that's going to be something which might seem strange to you given the ordinary mundane way that we have talked about memes. I'll call your attention to one particular set of memes um, that are grouped into a particular family of memes to maybe explicate this. We're all familiar with uh, the family of apocalypse memes in which no matter what the particular social or religious content that a particular embodiment of it might hold, they're all identifiable as belonging to the same family of memes purely on structural grounds. For example, you have the structural feature of a golden age in the past where everybody was good. Then you have the structural feature of a fall. Then you have the structural feature of things are getting so bad right now that we're about to see an apocalyptic climax, which will destroy most of the world, 
But it's okay because a small band of survivors are going to survive the apocalypse and they'll be able to just repopulate the earth according to their own ideology. And this might take the original form that Zarathustra envisioned it having in ancient Iran when he was really observing an astrological shift in the stars that he interpreted as a shift in a battle between good and evil that the good was ultimately going to win over evil. And of course, this gets um, morphed into the outright absurd Hollywood film 2012, which nobody was really sure what was going to happen in 2012. Some people thought it was going to be a failure of um, the uh, satellite communication because of something to do with the Earth's magnetic poles at the North and South Pole that was going to lead to no internet basically causing the apocalypse or maybe it was floods as you look at the cheesy movie photo, but it was just another example of the apocalypse meme. And of course, in the Reformation, there were active debates about whether the Pope was always already the Antichrist from the Four of Babylon, which was the reformer's perspective, or if one of the Protestant reformers was the Antichrist because he was turning people away from the, the one true church, which was the Catholic perspective. And of course, there were very passionate debates in the Reformation about which whether the Antichrist was a Protestant or a Catholic. But it turned out that none of those guys in the Reformation actually turned out to be the Antichrist. It was just another embodiment of the meme. And of course, Ray Kurzweil takes this beyond any religious, with a deity anyway, um, embodiment by telling us that, you know, any of the problems that plague the world today, like death, don't worry, they're going to be solved soon. For him, computers solving death is just the Zaratustrian motif of good finally defeating evil, and when it does, we're all going to live forever in machines. It's it's still the apocalypse meme. And John Michael Greer in the book Apocalypse Not showed that all of these, um, regardless of outright contradictory religious, social, political content, is identifiable as an example of the apocalypse meme stri strictly on structural features alone. And yet that's something which I find promising and yet only halfway developed, incompletely developed, I should say, in his analysis in that book, which I want to take further. But before I get to that, I want to examine, was Richard Dawkins really the originator of the term meme? Um, of course, we have the word, the English word meme coined by Richard Dawkins in The Selfish Gene in the 1970s to provide an explanation for phenomena he observed um, as an evolutionary biologist, which we didn't have a word for in English at that time. And he was talking about how ideas spread from mind to mind the way that genes spread through a population. In both cases, natural selection is going to be a factor that determines the success or failure of that particular, in one case, meme, in another case, gene. And because we didn't have a word in English to describe what he was talking about. He had to translate it from the ancient Greek word for imitation, which is minus thai, which basically follows the logic that an idea is, uh, excuse me, um, a meme is a viral content that will infect its host and then induce him or her to imitate the content to which they were exposed. So if you're infected with the apocalypse meme, you're going to be imitating the content of the apocalypse meme by spreading it to others through your own activity is the basic idea. And yet, I think that orthodoxy to Richard Dawkins' original intentions is far less important than interrogating the actual word from ancient Greek, which he stole basically to talk about this. And therefore, my use of the word meme, I don't want to be held hostage to the intentions of Richard Dawkins. I rather think that interrogating the concept of mimesis as it occurs especially in the works of Plato is going to get us beyond this notion that Richard Dawkins was the inventor of the meme, whereas what he really did was he just transliterated a word from ancient Greek. And that's why for me, Plato is a much better resource for what memeology as mimesis really means. Because whereas for Richard Dawkins, he was observing content from a biological perspective of natural selection, but Plato was more interested in the transcendental question of the philosophy of mimesis as something that is not limited to a set of objects in this world, but rather necessarily involves a realm beyond what our sense con uh, our sense um, faculties can experience. And of course, Plato was interested in the mimesis that occurs not from one organism to another, but from something you encounter in this world that you can recognize as, say, being beautiful. And the way that 
although a work of art might be an imitation of a beautiful thing, a beautiful thing is an imitation. It's performing mimesis on the idea of beauty itself. And whereas you might think naively that you can understand what beauty is by inductively generating an abstraction from a set of beautiful things that you encounter empirically, for Plato, it's actually the other way around. You can only encounter one beautiful thing empirically and recognize it as such if you already have some understanding of what beauty is. This is the paradox where you can't build it up inductively one piece at a time because in order to take the first step, you already have to have the ability to take that first step by having this pre-knowledge. This is one of the paradoxes of like Zeno's paradox. Can you take one step if you have to take an infinite number of micro steps to take one step? Heidegger's notion of pre-knowledge being this horizon of meaning where things are already meaningful to us. They're not just bits of matter that we attribute meaning to, they're already meaningful. And for Plato, who already understood this problem in the ancient era, it was because in the period between reincarnation um, from one body to another, you were able to be as a pure soul exposed to the ideas themselves. And therefore, the mimesis of art is just secondary to the mimesis of things in this life to the idea which they're like. But could we really say that it's active imitation? A beautiful horse, for example, Plato's own example, or let's just say a beautiful tree, okay, something that we can't certainly attribute agency to. Um, a tree might be beautiful, okay, a tree in the woods. Is it actively imitating beauty out of a conscious decision to want to be like it, which is basically the Richard Dawkins hypothesis? Or is that beautiful tree something which passively corresponds to the form of beauty, which you can recognize precisely because you have a pre-knowledge of what beauty would be. And that's why I make the distinction myself between shallow memes and deep memes. Most discussion of memes actually just focuses on shallow memes, which are kind of um, either social media content, what like the um, image with the superimposed text that I have displayed here, or they might be just ideas. You know, we have these minor ideas like um, the presidential campaign of a failed candidate. In 2011, we had like 15 Republican candidates. Every one of them had a platform. And it was a short-lived political ideology because most of them never got to take it beyond the year 2011, right? And most discussion of memes deal with shallow memes, which are these contingent um, embodiments of memes which, you know, have a success or failure that is short-lived and then you move on. But what really interests me is how the presupposition of shallow memes in the first place is the presence of these deep memes, which are not just bits of information that get spread on social media or on political channels, but rather their underlying structural forms, which shallow memes require to be understood in the first place. We can only understand a shallow meme that's presented to us if it has a minimal correspondence on a passive level with a deep meme which is already present as a structuring feature of consciousness itself. For example, Ray Kurzweil's prediction of the singularity is just a shallow meme, but it is only intelligible for those for whom the deep meme of progress is already providing a structural distortion of their thought. Without the deep meme of progress, the shallow meme of the singularity by Ray Kurzweil would be completely unintelligible. And therefore, for me, deep memes are not just content with linguistic information. They're really just so abstract and so structural that for me, they're just geometrical metaphors which provide a type of shape to consciousness. For me, deep memes can really be thought of as these four shapes of consciousness, which provide transitively a type of shape logic to shallow memes. And for me, they're not just eternal forms which already always exist, and nor are they just um, neutral frameworks through which contents get processed. Rather, they're geometrical metaphors for the unavoidable hard physical limit of a worldview as having to be adopted by a organism who is having to exist within hard physical limits that we don't usually think about. But for any worldview of a human, 
the hard physical limit will change. For example, for the hunter-gatherer, the hard physical limit of their existence is going to be wild food uh, sources harvested from nature. And even though it's not only a matter of just one of them being the sole resource for survival, you always need, for example, food and water and clean air, etc. There is a tendency, I would argue, for one resource to be transformed into the symbol of all of them. And for hunter-gatherers, maybe you could argue that the symbol of survival is something like big game, maybe something like a woolly mammoth in past times. And the geometrical metaphor for the woolly mammoth becomes something like a level plane of reciprocity in which you're not putting man above nature, rather there's a leveling out in which nature is anthropomorphized, culture is naturalized, as I'll explain in a moment, in greater detail. But this changes with the agrarian notion of the circle, in which the um, limit of survival changes from wild food harvested from nature to cyclically planted and harvested grain. And the agricultural cycle becomes something of a metaphor that distorts thought into the tendency to view things cyclically, to view history as a cycle, to view perfection as completion, etc. By breaking into fossil fuels, we actually um, introduce a whole nother kind of resource, which is fossil fuels. And petroleum really becomes the metaphor for survival itself by introducing the geometrical metaphor of a straight ascending line, which never retracts and never goes back to its origin. Radically different geometrical metaphor than the circle or the level plane, which also does not involve progress, but rather stability of a very sort of basic type. And of course, all of our metaphors make sense only on the basis of this underlying geometrical bias that um, is really just a, an incomplete glimpse into petroleum. Of course, that's not going to last forever. We've already passed peak oil, and the following age is going to be an age of what happens when you exhaust viable reserves of fossil fuels, but still have all of this legacy um, construction from a past era, which we wouldn't be able to build today, um, or excuse me, in that era. We wouldn't be able to build the skyscrapers of Chicago without fossil fuels. But these vast infrastructural monuments from the fossil fuel era will still be there, but they'll change function from the skyscrapers of the big banks and the wealthy into reserves of raw material which can be harvested and repurposed to radically different ends. And I think that the geometrical metaphor for living in an age of salvage is actually going to be the bell curve and the phenomenon of memory, as I'll explain in greater detail. So I'll just go through this kind of quickly. Um, in the hunter-gatherer worldview, you have a geometrical metaphor of reciprocity on the level plane because you're not putting nature above culture to try to subordinate nature just to fit our cultural needs, which is literally what we do in our era, regardless of all of the lip service to ecology and green this and green that. Um, in the context of the hunter-gatherer, you actually have a type of anthropomorphization of of nature in which, because animals are basically like human spirits, they can be influenced with pseudo-social rituals. And the teleology of that is to induce nature to allow human culture to survive because culture is not thought of as just an artificial construct as we think today. Rather, culture is thought of as naturalized. Hunter-gatherer tribes often don't have a word for religion because their religion simply is the truth. They often don't have a word for themselves because they're just the people. In their language, the people is simply them. And that's, of course, in line with the underlying hard physical limit that would be um, tending more towards the reciprocity of a level plane rather than towards progress or any other sort of geometrical metaphor that we're more familiar with from living in, for example, the agrarian worldview where the deep meme of the circle replaces the deep meme of the level plane because cyclically planted and harvested grain replaces big game and wild roots as the crucial resource for survival. And the tendency to think circularly um, takes over even when you're not talking necessarily about agriculture. For example, for Aristotle, a circle is a perfect line. It's a line, which we wouldn't even consider it to be in our era, that unlike incomplete lines, which go on without closure, it has 
completeness, and that's what makes it perfect. History is cyclical, as some pre-modern historians have thought, in that it has repeating processes. But of course, with the age of oil, by accessing literally an explosive amount of concentrated energy, short-term progress becomes the norm, which is misinterpreted into the general shape for interpreting everything. This leads to a change in the very definition of co concepts that were already defined in the agrarian era, taking on a different meaning now. For example, perfection no longer means completion. Now it means expansion. History is no longer cyclical. Now it's simply infinite progress, which is always going to go on. But of course, in the future, that will not be so distant. Fossil fuels are going to be depleted to the point that industrial accomplishments from the past are going to lose their original use and become stores of salvage materials to be repurposed to fit the needs of a world without petroleum, to fit needs that were unimaginable to the people who originally engineered these skyscrapers and other soon to be useless monuments of progress. And the geometrical metaphor is similarly going to change to the bell curve, which is not coincidentally also the graphical representation of the mathematics of peak oil. The rate of discovery, um, extraction, peak decline and loss of a fossil fuel resource literally is the bell curve. We're currently right at the very top of the process and that we just hit peak oil. We're a little bit past the peak. And this is going to get morphed, I argue, into a way of thinking about contents that incorporates the memory of an age of abundance, not with the expectation that it can be recovered or the expectation that it will go on forever, but rather with the realization that we're situated contextually in history in an era where the lingering influence of monuments, which also not coincidentally still tower above us, is something that has to be repurposed into needs that the past could not have envisioned, but which still can be useful to us. And therefore, there are no neutral concepts. There's no such thing as one concept like perfection or like um, history that has no distortion from a geometrical bias of a deep meaning. The same shallow meme, for example, of perfection will mean something radically different to an agrarian or to a fossil fuel context. For example, if you look at the meme um, on the top right-hand corner, God for Thomas Aquinas is perfect, not because he's progressively becoming more perfect, but because he's always already been perfect. And therefore for Thomas Aquinas, it would be absurd for somebody already completely perfect to become more perfect. You're misunderstanding the concept of perfection if you don't understand for Thomas Aquinas that it, it simply is that completion. Of course, in our era, infinite space exploration replaces God as the standard of perfection. And precisely because we would be offended by the concept of something already being perfect, because then it couldn't become more perfect through progress. Therefore, the notion not just of some space exploration, but of infinite space exploration in Star Trek, traversing um, distances which would be impossible for anybody to traverse becomes the norm because we couldn't be satisfied just with going to the moon because of the underlying geometrical bias which distorts our thought process and leads to a concept like perfection having to be fit to the underlying um, needs of the deep meme without which we wouldn't be able to think. And therefore, memes make sense on a way that can't be reduced to linguistic making sense or to logical making sense. In fact, many of our memes do not make any sense logically. They don't make any sense mathematically, but they do make sense memeologically. This is why I argue for a unique science of memeology. They make sense memeologically because of a minimal correspondence between the deep meme and the shallow meme to which the subject has been exposed. And if you think about our core, I guess, um, shallow but still somewhat less shallow than other underlying memes to, which get um, morphed into lots of other concepts, we have usury, which is a basis for understanding financial and economic theory. But usury itself only makes sense with the presence of the deep meme of progress. Usury would make no sense in a circular meme where you're not going to have growth to pay back interest later. Nor would it make sense 
with a hunter gatherer level plane because there you also don't have progress later to add the extra income to pay off the interest which you're foolishly agreeing to pay back by taking out a loan now automation also doesn't make sense because machines require enormous investment and break down quickly it's a process which can only make sense on the expectation that you're going to have enough growth in the future to finance making a good return on your investment cars make no sense because you build the city according to the expectation that commuting 100 miles a day to from the suburbs to the city is going to be sustainable or it's really not but we don't see the countersensical contradictions of these objects because they do make sense to us meteorologically therefore the same thing will literally transform into something else there's also no neutral things outside of geometrical bias and deep mean for example an iphone is the symbol of progress itself in our era but without fossil fuels it would transform literally into an ugly heap of plastic metal and glass is what that should say and that shows that deep memes are the very presupposition for any shallow meme to make sense and therefore the purpose of deep memes is literally to allow you to understand the world understanding the world is something which we usually think of as this inductive process in which you would have to build up your understanding of the world one fact at a time in order to enumerate the whole set of facts that is the world how we naively think of it and yet understanding the world is i would say radically deductive one has to already have a deep meme in order to even begin the process of understanding one fact at a time to build up the world as though that's even possible therefore understanding the world isn't objective but that's the whole point it doesn't have to be objective because it can only ever be twisted geometrically and biased conceptually by the deep meme which allows it to be in the first place therefore the question of who's right um defies the simple binary of truth and falsity that we usually have to talk about um progress uh, from outdated ways of viewing the world to our way of viewing the world we usually think that the agrarian worldview is simply false in that these were people who didn't have science and with modern science we've simply supplemented their falsity with now we know the truth and we largely um handle that way of understanding the errors of the past by thinking of truth value as some mathematical result that you get from formulating sentences in a logically valid way that will yield the truth value um, as a result of being true yeah i don't think truth value is something that is a mathematical result of proper syntax i think that truth value which is a valid concept is something that simply results to presence and absence truth value will be true if the presence of the vital underlying resource which your deep meaning is a metaphor of is present if that resource is absent or if it's overshadowed by the presence of some more imposing thing in the sense that we don't get away from grain in our era but we have it eclipsed by oil to where now the um underlying geometrical metaphor has to also become linear progress which makes all of the pathways of viewing the world false despite the fact that ancient egyptian notions of economics are actually much more successful sustaining a civilization for thousands of years than our faulty economic models which can't even get reliable results on a day-to-day year-to-year basis and therefore the notion of memology as a unique science which cannot be accounted for by linguistics um is built into the way that making sense memologically and being true memologically are irreducible to notions of syntax also irreducible irreducible to creativity of course in linguistics creativity is the notion that every sentence you speak outside of a handful of conventional sentences like hey how's it going or goodbye or good to see you outside of those sort of politenesses every sentence you speak is a new sentence and almost every sentence you understand is a new sense the mystery of understanding new sentences and generating new sentences is accounted for in linguistics with the concept of creativity which mathematically is similar to the way that if you have the set of all numbers for which x uh for every x uh square it and give us x squared might give you a set of infinitely large 
um, number of different numbers. But although the set of numbers is infinitely large, they're not random. You can still take any one of those numbers and provide a structural description of it as a result of squaring an input. And therefore, language is kind of like that. The number of new sentences is infinite, but it's not random in that you can formalize these syntactic rules for how a sentence was generated in conformity with a rule. And you might be tempted to think that that equipment for generating, spreading, and evaluating language is simply hijacked by means. We simply use those resources that our brain already has in order to generate memes as happens by the millions on social media. But I think that that's only valid if you are assuming that a meme has a linguistic content. And if a linguistic content has to be present in a meme, that would mean that there's only one message in any one meme. And this notion of a message, which maybe is spelled out linguistically with the right words put into a sentence that is merely already under the surface before you add the superimposed words on a template, would lead you to have to say that, for example, only one political party could ever use a meme properly because the underlying message in outright contradictory embodiments of the same meme by, say, Republican or Democrat uses would have to be something that only one of them was getting it right. And yet there's a strange sense in which conservative and liberal political pages on Facebook can equally legitimately and equally effectively use the same meme. In a certain sense, they're all using it right because the meme is not inherently bearing a linguistic message, which you then just explicitly put into words. There's something other than that at the bottom. And I think that we have to go to Aristotle to explain this, because for Aristotle, you have something radically different from the linguistic turn. The linguistic turn of Habermas or later Heidegger, later Wittgenstein, which there's nothing outside language. And the emphasis just becomes analyzing language games um, to death, um, it's something you don't have in Aristotle, because for Aristotle, language is secondary to another type of comprehension, which is the comprehension of form. As I noted in my recent video on Aristotle, beginning of On Interpretation, he notes that language is actually secondary because before you put things into uh, linguistic symbols, before you put things into either words or written symbols, you already have a grabbing of the things of the world through what he calls experiences which are images okay it's crucial that aristotle calls the experience of things images because he's noting that what's going on in the shift from comprehending something by taking its form and talking about it with language is kind of analogous to what happens in kant when you go from you know sense contents which are sort of schematized imaginatively, and then you have a linguistic concept under which they're subsumed. There's something really radical in the gap between the sort of imagistic processing um, of sense contents and the linguistic concept under which they're subsumed. In fact, sense contents and linguistic concepts are so different, Kant says, that you have to have the imagination provides something of a miracle in order to make that move. And yet for Aristotle, although he may not have paid quite as much attention to what goes on in between, he did note that when you're understanding something primordially, it's not that you have a sentence with the right words to tell you what it is. Um, it's rather that you grasp the form of the thing because the intellect has this miraculous ability to understand shapes meaningfully. The classic example of a ring which leaves its form in a piece of wax, which you can understand um, not only without having the sentence to talk about, you can also understand without having the material it's made of. Simply take the form and you can grasp what it is. I think builds on the idea I've been expressing this whole time that a deep mean is more of a shape with a meaning than it is something of a linguistic message with only one ultimate content. Or information and therefore the aesthetic hypothesis is inadequate to the task of memes. You might be tempted to think that memes are just art um, and certainly entertainment is important in memes in that a meme that has no entertainment value is not going to survive the natural selection process on social media of getting like a million shares. But for Kant, art is art only if it has no purpose, because keep in mind that an aesthetic experience relies on a reflective judgment that where one does not have a concept readily available to understand what something is. Therefore, 
the subjective faculties just enter free play in which harmony, not rational comprehension, is the standard of beauty. I'd refer you to my video on Kant's critique of judgment for a more complete uh, explanation of that. But basically for Kant, it's only art if you don't understand it and if it has no purpose. If you have a beautiful wine vase, it might be beautiful like concomitantly, but it is not art. And therefore I think memes are also not art because although they might be enjoyed as entertainment, that's merely secondary in the same way that enjoying a beautiful table is merely secondary to the function it has to hold things like your dinner while you're eating. And memes have a very clear teleological purpose. It's a very important teleological purpose in that arguably most important of all, it provides the schema by which the entire world can be understood by the subject. And, you know, what are we doing tonight? The same thing we do every night, Pinky, we try to understand the whole world. We cannot build it up inductively with language, one piece at a time, one sentence at a time, one correct word at a time, the way natural scientists are literally trying to do that right now, build up an understanding of the whole universe, one linguistic unit at a time. Rather, we have to already grasp the form or shape in order to have language in the first place. I think linguistic systems are secondary to memological uh, biases that understand the world. And this leads to a number of other systems becoming secondary to memes. We also think that memes are just viral images with text that get shared by machines. They're simply electronic data that gets shared by machines, but it's actually the other way around. Memes are not shared by machines. Machines are memes. As you look at Batman slapping Robin, um, machines are shallow memes that embody the biases of the fossil fuel worldview which is the expectation of an infinite return on a finite investment. Outside of that, all of the exorbitant in, um, infrastructural and fossil fuel and financial investment into dead end machines, like some of the military technology that the United States is building, which is actually just scamming the taxpayer by investing like a trillion dollars into a plane that doesn't even fly. Um, machines make no sense outside the promise that fossil fuels are going to be infinite. And therefore, if you really want to understand memes, you have to go beyond the analysis of how social media networks share images to instead think about how social media itself relies on this underlying unspoken bias that we think is simply the only way to view the world. So thank you for watching, and this will be published on Kindle, a much fuller explanation. Um, I'll publish it on PDF uh, probably this weekend, maybe tomorrow. So thanks for watching.